Hi, my name is Zana Freylon. I'm the author of The Bone Sparrow um, and I live in Melbourne, Australia in kind of a semi-rural area. Um, lots of trees, lots of beautiful river bushland quite close by so if you go down at the right time you can see kangaroos and wombats, um, some pretty dangerous snakes but they're very shy so you tend not to see them much and a whole lot of beautiful uh, bird life which is really lovely and it's just the perfect place to, to write books. Um, I live with my husband and three boys, they're aged 11, 9 and 7 and we have two beautiful golden retriever dogs as well. Before I started writing, uh, I worked in schools for many years. Uh, I was an integration aide for a long time um, and I worked with some really wonderful kids who had difficulty being at school and these were just fantastic kids to work with and I really got to know them in a way that um, not many people did get to know them and I feel very pri privileged to have known them uh, in that way and they certainly these are kids which have certainly had an impact on me and uh, I often find myself writing their characters into my stories because they were really very special kids. Um, and then after I was an integration aide I got my teaching degree. Uh, I was a primary school teacher but only for a very short period of time because then I had kids of my own uh, and I fell into writing which is just like a dream come true, I love it. So The Bone Sparrow is the story of Subi. He's a nine-year-old boy and he lives in an immigration detention centre. And Subi was actually born inside the immigration detention centre. So the only world he knows is the world inside those barbed wire fences. Um, and while this is, is really hard for Subi, it's also what gives him his strength and his resilience and he's got this wonderful imagination and a real thirst for stories and he's always asking people for stories and imagining the world outside those fences and because he's never experienced it for himself he doesn't know how unusual his own life is so he doesn't know that it's not every child's experience to wake up in an old camp bed with his sister and 40 other people inside a tent that gets really really hot in the summer and grows mold up the sides and he doesn't know that it is not right for kids to have to or for anyone to have to line up for two hours for each meal or to fill out a form and wait a few days to see a doctor so i decided to write the bone sparrow from the point of view of a young child because a child's mind is so wide open to possibility. They aren't constrained by circumstance like adults are. They're full of hope and resilience and imagination. And they're imagining the world they want to live in, the kind of adults they want to be in that world. And the future they imagine is very different to the future that we as adults imagine. And I think one of the things with adults is that we forget the importance of imagination and the importance of dreaming and the importance of hope and we focus too much on our own constraints um, and kids don't seem to have that that problem they they just have this wonderful wide open imagination and that's that's what I needed for my character I needed someone who was hopeful and who dreamed and who imagined a whole list of potential futures that he would one day be part of um, and that's what Subi gave me So I knew I wanted to write about detention centres and refugee camps for a long time. Um, we've had mandatory detention in Australia since the early 90s or late 90s. Um, and I actually thought when I began writing that this would be almost a historical fiction. I didn't think we would continue our policy of locking up children in detention centres indefinitely. Um, unfortunately, the situation has only got worse and the policy is more and more inhumane. But when I was thinking about writing this book, I was reading lots of articles and watching lots of news reports and there were lots of policies and statistics and numbers, but what I was missing was the voices behind those numbers and the people. And I knew that that's what I wanted to hear. I wanted to see the people and I wanted to hear their voices. And these were, you know, these are real people. They're not numbers and they're not policies. These are real people who are seeking asylum and seeking asylum is not a crime, it's, a, it's been recognised as a human right and yet we are locking these people up, we are putting them in, in conditions which have been described as torturous by the United Nations um, 
in camps which have been likened to the World War II camp, concentration camps. Um, so this is what I wanted. I wanted to explore and learn and discover more about these people and who they, who they were and what life would be like for them growing up in this, in this circumstance. One of the reasons I write is uh, to explore and discover and learn. And so I knew I, this was something I wanted to write about. Um, but I didn't have a character yet. And when I write, my books are very character based. So I spent a long time just thinking about it and doing a bit of research. And then I came across a newspaper article um, about a woman who had been granted refugee status and she was living in the community with her two children and as part of her refugee status she had to keep going back to the immigration department for regular meetings and one day she went back to the immigration department and she was told that she'd been given an adverse risk assessment by ACO and she said well what's that mean and they said well it means that we don't think you're safe to live in the community and she said well what's what's this based on they said I'm sorry that's confidential information she said can I see the evidence and they said no that's confidential so she was immediately put back in a detention center with her two kids and right down the end of the article was just a sentence which said that two days after she'd been put back in detention she discovered she was pregnant and I don't know why but I'd never thought about kids being born in refugee camps and detention centers before and it's ridiculous because of course kids are born in these places but I'd never thought about it um, and as soon as I read that, I had my character and I had someone who wouldn't know anything of the outside world and who would only know what he'd been born into, which was the detention centre. When I first wrote uh, The Bone Sparrow and first wrote the character of Subi, I didn't want to give him a background and I didn't want to give him that sense of cultural identity because I wanted to make the point that we're all people and no matter where we come from we're all the same but it became really clear that our culture and our stories that are passed down are very much a part of who we are and even doesn't matter where you're born your family story is very important so I needed to give him a background and about the same time where I was trying to work out where his family had come from there was an incident which was reported quite widely of uh, some Rohingya refugees who were stranded at sea on a boat and the boat had no petrol, there was no water, there was no food and they'd been there for a few weeks already and no one was doing anything to help. So there was government agencies all around the world who knew what was happening, governments everywhere knew what was happening and they were all arguing over whose responsibility these people were and some countries wanted to send them one way, other countries wanted to send them another way, and no one was doing anything to help. And meanwhile, these people were dying, their bodies were being thrown overboard. And after a few weeks of this, it was some fishermen, some local fishermen who went out there and rescued these people. Um, and so I looked into the Rohingya people. Um, they're a minority Muslim group in Myanmar or Burma. And they're said to be one of the most persecuted people on earth. And I'd never heard about the Rohingya people before. And um, I, was, I was ashamed that I'd never heard about these people. And I also, it was interesting to me that it was a Muslim minority in a predominantly um, a Buddhist society. And they were the people being persecuted. Um, so yeah, so they, that became Subi's background and his culture. So when I was doing the research for The Bone Sparrow, I relied mostly on uh, the internet and the resources I could find there. Um, and I used a lot of resources, media reports, documentaries, that kind of thing. And also some more, I guess, unusual resources, which were, um, at the time I was researching, I found a whole lot of heavily redacted incident reports from the detention centres. And although a whole lot of it had been blacked out, that you could get a lot of information from what was there. Uh, and I also used pictures drawn by kids in refugee camps and detention centres, and they gave me, I think, the most valuable information because they really showed inside the mind of the kids. Um, there was one picture in particular which had been drawn by an eight-year-old, and it was of this little stick figure behind this fence, and he was crying, and it was sort of what you'd expect, but then in the corner was the sun, and the sun was angry. And it was so, it was such a moving picture because to have something like the sun so beautiful, being so angry, it was really very moving. 
Um, so I used a lot of kids' drawings, uh, poetry that some kids had written. I found some poetry kids had written, and that was really insightful as well. Uh, and I thought about going out to some detention centres. I couldn't go. The Bone Sparrow is mostly based around the detention centres which are offshore in Australia, and I couldn't go to those because no one's allowed in them, not even the UN can gain access to those centres. Um, but there were some local detention centres which I could have applied for access to, and I thought about it a lot. And in the end, I decided I didn't want to go to these places because I had nothing to offer the people there. I didn't want to take their stories and use them in this own, in my own fictitious tale. Um, and there was nothing I could give these people in return. So I decided, you know, it was a fictitious tale and it was Subi's story and I didn't want to be taking someone else's story. What I hope I have done is maybe created some sort of bridge from this fictitious voice to, to the real voices and the actual voices. And um, if I can inspire other people to sort of look forward and to, to talk to people themselves, then that would be great. So the book I'm working on at the moment actually came out of some research which I um, had found when I was researching the Bone Sparrow. And it's about kids who um, have come across refugee children who have come across as unaccompanied minors. And what's happened is with the increasing refugee crisis and more and more of these kids coming across and seeking asylum, um, they've fallen into the hands of traffickers and people are picking up these kids and turning them into slaves. And so these kids are being told that yes, they'll, they'll provide um, them with somewhere to stay or some food, but then these kids end up having massive debts and being told, well, you know, we took you from place A to place B and now you owe us big time and you need to pay us back before you can actually be free. So there's been a huge increase in modern day slavery and in particular child slavery. Um, so when I came across that bit of that, that research, um, I knew that that was what my next book would be about. Um, and interestingly enough, often when I'm, I'm thinking of books and, and researching, if I come across an article which might not work for this particular book, but it might work for a, a future book, I cut it out and I put it into a notebook I have. And when I was going back through my notebooks, I had the feeling that I, I'd come across this idea of child slavery before. And I actually found an article I'd cut out from 2012 which was um, in an Australian newspaper and it was about 17 refugee children who had gone missing from an Australian detention centre and no one knew where they'd gone and it was feared that they had been trafficked into slavery. And that was it, there was one article, nothing after it and I've got no idea if these kids were ever found, um, certainly nothing was reported on it. And that was back in 2012, so uh, that's what my next book is on. So one of the wonderful things about books is that they allow us to experience situations which are more extreme and more dangerous than anything we might experience in our own lives. And also to understand people in a different way and not just people from different cultures and different life experiences but to understand that we are all just people and that to understand someone is sometimes to understand that you don't know what they've gone through and you don't know what their life experiences are, but that's okay. And I think um, one of the reasons, one of the questions I often get asked in The Bone Sparrow is about um, Harvey, who's one of the guards at the detention centre. And, you know, he's, a, he's one of the really nice guards. He's a friend to the kids. He doesn't call them by their numbers that they've been assigned like the other guards do. He calls them by their names. He brings in blow-up pools on the really hot days and he tries to make life as good as he can for these kids. But Harvey also has his weaknesses and I wanted to show that because that's, you know, that's okay. People, people aren't always good or always bad. There's always a reason behind actions and I think um, that's something really important to explore in books. Everyone, but also, you know, especially kids, are really there's this thirst for understanding and knowledge. Um, and I think books provide such a wonderful way to gain those experiences. We can walk in someone else's shoes 
and really understand what it's like to be someone else. Um, knowing that, you know, we may be changed from the experience, but we're, we're in a very safe space. And at any time we can close the book and walk away. Um, and I think it's, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, and I think, you know, as humans, we're hardwired to imagine. And if you think way back to, you know, the time of cave people and cave paintings, and that's one of my favorite times in history because that's the first sort of evidence of human storytelling and imagination. And people had to imagine to survive. So they had not seen these wild beasts that were painted on the cave before they'd walked into this cave. And they knew that what the person had done by putting them on the wall was to tell them that there is this beast out there that you haven't seen before, but you know, it's got horns and these massive hooves and it's huge and you need to start thinking about how you're gonna survive, otherwise you won't. Um, so I think imagination is part of, part of being human. Um, and I think books, they're the same as those cave paintings. They're, they're ways of telling a story and allowing people to imagine what their lives might be like. And especially for kids who's, you know, who they're imagining their future already and they're imagining what the world will be like and the kind of adult they're going to be. And who knows what the future will bring. So if you can read as many different existences as possible and try and imagine how you would respond in that certain situation, um, then that's, that's how we survive as, as people. And I think with books, it's, we can really internalise those experiences. We can really get inside someone else's skin and get inside their head. And that's such a beautiful thing. Ready? Yeah. Sometimes at night, the dirt outside turns into a beautiful ocean, as red as the sun and as deep as the sky. I lie on my bed, Queenie's feet pushing against my cheek, and listen to the waves lapping at the tent. Queenie says I'm stupid saying that kind of stuff, but it's true, she just doesn't see it is all. Our ma says there are some people in this world who can see all the hidden bits and pieces of the universe blown in on the north wind and scattered about in the shadows. Queenie, she never tries to look in the shadows. She doesn't even squint. Ma sees though. She can hear the ocean outside too. You hear it, ne? I whisper, my fingers feeling for her smile in the dark. In the morning, the ground still wet and foamy from where those waves washed up, I sit and trace the hundreds of animals that have swum all the way up to the tent, their faces pushed against the flaps, trying to get a look at us inside on our beds. Queenie says they aren't real beds, but just old army cots and even older army blankets. Queenie says that a real bed is made with springs and cushions and feathers, and that real blankets don't itch. I don't think those animals would know the difference, or really care much either. This morning, I found a shell washed up right along with those animals. I breathed in its smell all hot and salty fish like the very bottom of the ocean. And even though Queenie doesn't believe and grunted about when was I ever going to grow up and could I please quit bothering her all the goddamn time, she still gave me her last bit of paper and said I could borrow her pen so I could write the words in black at the top of the page. The night sea with creatures. I drew a picture as best as I could with no colours and paper that curled from the damp. Using her pen and paper only cost me my soap and I'll steal that back from her later anyway. Sisters shouldn't charge their own brothers for paper. I snug up with Ma, my legs curled up in hers, but careful not to wake her because today is one of her tired days, and I look through all the pictures in my box. I'll need to find a new box soon. The rats have eaten most of one side, and what's left is wet and mouldy, even after I left it out in the sun to dry. There are some pictures down the bottom that are headed with Ma's writing from way back, before I could write on my own. I like Ma's writing more. When she writes, it's like the words seep out onto the page, already perfect. I push my fingers over Ma's letters, breathing them in like the smells from my shell. Tomorrow, when she's better, I'll show Ma my new picture and the shell and tell her again about the night sea and its treasures. I'll tell her every little bit and listen to her laugh and watch her smile. When I untangle my legs and whisper that it's just about breakfast time and does she want to come eat, I see her eyes open a bit and the smile start on her lips. Just a little longer, ne? she says, in her English that never sounds right. I not hungry much, Subi love. Ma's never hungry much. The last time she ate a full meal and didn't just peck at her food was when I was only 19 fence diamonds high. I remember because that was on Queenie's birthday, and Ma always measures us on our birthdays. By now, I am at least 21, or 22, or maybe even 22 and a half high. I haven't been measured in a while.